Hi, my name is Joe, and uh, my dad's a rocket scientist. And in this first episode, you'll learn a little bit about him, uh, his history, where he came from, how he got into science, hear a couple stories, get a little deep on... Uh, on cosmic rays and stuff like that, but uh, this is just sort of a background episode. We'll we'll get into more sort of details of uh, what are detectors and black holes and stuff like that in further episodes. Uh, I promise we'll get better <laughs> as the time goes on and as we, we get more used to this. I uh, hope you enjoy it, hope you learn something, and uh, just have a good day. Enjoy. All right, well, hello. My name is Joe, and uh, my dad's a rocket scientist, so uh, say hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. All right. Uh, So on this uh, first uh, inaugural little podcast interview thing, uh, I think the best thing, well, first of all, Dad, do you consider yourself a a rocket scientist? Uh, I don't consider myself a complete rocket scientist. I sort of, maybe a mini rocket scientist in that I have a lot of experience putting together instruments that go on satellites and how they work. And then I know a little bit more about the satellites themselves. And I know some about the rocket, but not all the ins and outs and everything. So it's a little here, a little there about being a rocket scientist. Okay. So that that's a, it's a good, good way to start a, a podcast called, uh, my dad, the rocket scientist, by finding out that, uh, in fact, my dad is not a rocket scientist. Uh, I think technically you're you're an astrophysicist, right? Right, but I do have the T-shirt that says, actually, I am a rocket scientist, so who knows? And and really, T-shirt and a bumper sticker, that, that's really, that's all you need, right? You got it. Okay, so, I mean, I guess let's, let's go back to the beginning. How, were you always interested in space, or, or how did you sort of get into the, the world of rocket scientisty astrophysics well i don't know about getting into the astrophysics part that was a lot later what i really remember is watching all of the u.s launches out of cape canaveral in the early days when they were trying to launch rockets that didn't blow up and get satellites going and then you started uh hearing the results from the satellites walter cronkite talking and just all that sort of stuff and then they finally sent some probes to the moon and the first couple of them missed the moon but then they had ones that came in and just gave these great pictures of the moon and that just really jazzed me about doing things in space so what what was it like you mentioned sort of watching the all the rockets blowing up uh when they were trying to launch and i think We've all seen the sort of the the, the newsreel footage of, of that sort of thing, and I'm assuming you guys were watching that on on TV, or was it listening to it on the radio? Oh, it was. Every one of those was uh, televised in those days. It was a huge deal. Uh, ever since I guess Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon, and even before him with uh, Vanguard rockets and the Red Stones and stuff like that, Atlas Centaurs. It was just always a, a live broadcast I think for the launches and I tried to catch as many of them as I could so what what was that like watching those sort of the like the failed launches because I I mean I remember you know when the Challenger blew up and when the Challenger you know disintegrated on re-entry and uh, I think more recently was it what the, the the SpaceX or the blue origin that that broke up coming back in what what was that that like watching it? Well, it it wasn't anywhere near as traumatic since there were no people in, involved in it. They were all unmanned launches. There were no astronauts on any of those. And it was just, it was exciting. Will it make it? Will it do it? And sometimes, oh, no, it didn't, you know. And other times, all oh, right, it, it made it all the way through the launch. And now you could go to uh, the control center, the news would, and you could see the plot on the screen of where it was going around the earth and stuff like that. It was just really neat to follow that stuff. And what was the, what was your first sort of thoughts on, you said when the, we got the first photos back from satellites landing on the moon or going around the moon? I just thought it was really cool. I mean, it's, you know, here you are. We'd always talked about going, you know, we, I mean, 
people talked about going to the moon and having men on the moon and there were science fiction stories and all of that, even old movies of Jules Verne's book. But we were doing it and you could really see what it looked like. And the closer you got, you started to see, yeah, it's just more and more craters and stuff. And I remember when the astronauts were going to go finally do a landing there, how deep would the dust be on the moon? Would they sink down to their knees in dust or not? And it was just always interesting to see what in the world was going to happen. Very cool. All right. So you sort of grew up in that, that, that rocket age. And then uh, what, what next? Did you like build models of rockets yeah. as a kid? Well, I was, I bought every, I think every Ravel plastic model kit of airplanes and ships. I, I was also into World War II stuff and World War I. I read a lot of books about uh, the early flyers in World War I and World War II. Quentin Reynolds, they fought for the sky. And then later on, God is my co-pilot about the Jimmy Doolittle raid on Tokyo. And just, I was into building all these models and I think that sort, and I liked building things. And I can remember once trying to build sort of a soapbox kind of car with two by fours and orange crate and tearing apart a couple pair of roller skates and trying to nail them on and get it to work. I liked building things. All right. So like in your sort of elementary school, high school, that sort of age, uh, do you, you do science classes yeah. or? Oh, yeah, I was... I, I was good at math and science. I didn't like English because you had to write these things called term papers with footnotes and references. And they, they we were always reading books that I wasn't interested in. You know, I didn't care about weathering heights and this sort of thing. I was more interested in Dobie Gillis books and things that were not considered high class literature. So, but I gravitated towards math and science. I was good at math and relatively good at science and always kept was interested in it and i had a cousin who uh, was an engineer with trw and he got together with me for a while and said we're going to build a voltmeter and that there was a company called heathkit and they would send you all the parts and instructions for building electronics and this was a voltmeter and so he and I spent several weekends, you know, slowly putting it together and soldering parts in and stuff like that. And that that also got to be fun. And I like that about being able to build real electronics. I remember in grad school, I went and got a Heath kit for an amplifier for my uh, hi-fi system and I soldered it all on a dining room table. And finally got it all together, and by golly, it worked. And that was my hi-fi amplifier for many years. And so that was sort of your your introduction, really, into the the building science part of of what you like doing. Yeah, it was building a real piece of electronics instead of just some plastic kit, you know, of an airplane and stuff. But the plastic kits did get me learning about all the parts and how parts go together and what they were. So it's, it was all, I like building things. And then I got into building electronics a little bit, but uh, it was really that I was good at math and science. All right. So high school graduating, where, where did you go? Were you, uh, my, were you like first... poached by anyone or? Ha. <laughs> My high school guidance counselor says, go apply to Cornell and Penn. I didn't get into Cornell. I got into Penn. So oh, right. Ivy League. None, none of this thing about, oh, let's have visits and, oh, let's really check the place out. I just That's what the high school guidance counselor said to do, so I did it. So I went to Penn for two years. I started out as a math major because I thought I was really good in math. And then I ran into a course called Set Theory. And that's when I decided I better not continue in math. So I went and became a physics major and still took a bunch of math, but it was all applied math, not real theoretical math kind of courses. And uh, I also was playing soccer at Penn and had a little too much fun at Penn. So 
I, uh, after two years, I came back to St. Louis and finished up at Washington University in St. Louis and, as a and, physics. And you, you came back of your, your own free will, or were you, were you dragged back? Uh, I was told that uh, maybe it would be better. It was something about those two Ds in German that didn't help. So uh, anyway, All right. yeah, my parents said, come on back, and it was good for me. I finished up at Washington U, which is a very good school. I That was my first experience, actually, with building something as that a professor was interested in and that Peter Phillips was developing uh, instruments to look at particle physics experiments. So I mean how and how he, did how did that how did that work out? Was it you're just in his class and he sort of said, Hey class, this is what you're doing, or did he say, Hey, hey Richard, I need your help? Well it was more, you know, he was looking for volunteers to help and I volunteered in that didn't get paid for doing this, but it was experience on for me. So uh, I just sort of went up and said, hey, I'd like to help out if I can. What can I do? And he said, all right, here's what we're going to do. And he had me uh, build some stuff in the shop. And that was sort of my first experience with a real machinist's shop. And uh, I can remember one vividly tapping a quarter 20 a uh, hole in a piece of aluminum and the man in the shop said, now take it easy. And I said, oh, this isn't hard and promptly snapped off the the tap and it broke. And so I learned there, no, no, you listen to the machinists. And that was a learning experience. But I also, at this time, Peter Phillips had this neat idea in that he needed mirrors, not real big mirrors, but you know, a foot diameter kind of mirrors to focus some of the light that he would use in his particle physics experiment. And he had this idea of making a mold that was the shape of the mirror and then filling it with liquid epoxy and spinning it. And by spinning it, it it would form almost the perfect shape that he would want for a, a mirror. And this was a whole lot cheaper than getting a piece of glass and having to, you know, dig out you don't really dig but you polish you grind out it down the, yeah grind it down yeah and this went real quick and that was a great idea unfortunately in those days epoxies uh would leave us a film on the top surface and that was became a rough surface and that didn't turn out to be a great way to do it but it was a marvelous idea and i don't know if it's at the same time or a little while later roger angel at the university of arizona set up the mirror lab where they would make real mirrors and they would have a mold maybe five feet across 10 feet across this sort of thing fill it with pyrex glass and it would be in an oven and they'd heat the oven up so the pyrex melted and they would spin it and that would form you know almost the perfect shape of a mirror and they'd have to very slowly let the bring the temperature down so the glass didn't crack, and then they would just have a small amount of polishing and grinding to do as opposed to digging out a whole lot of it. And he's making mirrors to this day for some of the top telescopes in the world, and he does it this way. And so when they, they spun it, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, it's on a record player, giant Lazy Susan-y thing. How, how fast do these things spin? I mean, I'm assuming relatively slow, right? Well, it, I think it depends. I don't, have no idea how okay. fast they actually spin them, but it depends on the viscosity, the thickness of the glass, and I'm sure that's a temperature-dependent thing, but they want to spin it so that they get the approximate shape and they know the right temperatures and the right spin rates to do it. And so that's that's sort of what happened back in the day when Hubble's, they, they made that big mirror for Hubble and launched it and it was all all messed up because of the the mirror well they didn't spin that mirror that okay. one they polished in the old-fashioned way of grinding it out and polishing it it was going to be the best mirror ever made and the smoothness of it is is just marvelous but they had to measure it to make sure that you know all right how close are we to the required shape 
And the, so the story goes, I'm not sure if it's true or not, but it's the story I've heard, that they had a rod that they would use to put up one end of it against the mirror and the other end to where a, right where a laser was to be. And then they'd shine the laser and see what pattern they got as, as a way of knowing if it was how close it was to being the perfect shape. And one end of the rod was slightly rounded to match the rounding of the mirror where it touched, and the other end was just flat. And apparently, one time they did it that way, and another time they did it with the thing, the rod in backwards. And so the flat end was up against the mirror, which made the distance off by, you know, some very small amount, less than a millimeter. And then they had to decide which one of the two measurements they were going to go with in that they gave two different answers. And Hubble was under very big pressure for schedule and costs, and they decided to go with one measurement, and that was the wrong one. And so the mirror shape is just very, very small amount out of the right shape. And that made the beautiful pictures from Hubble fuzzy because it was called spherical aberration. And then there was, in order to fix it, there was a guy at Goddard who said, I know how to fix that. We'll just put a little lens in front of each one of the instruments on Hubble, and that can do the correction. So like glasses. And yeah, they gave it a pair of glasses in front of each one of the four instruments that were on board. And they put it up there, and that's what brought all the beautiful pictures down now, and they were just fine. And so with all the servicing missions where they replace instruments with newer, more modern ones, they already have the lens built into the instrument. So after a little while, they were able to take out the one piece of apparatus that held the glasses in front of each uh, instrument. And uh, Hubble is making phenomenal pictures to this day. And so, okay, so they, they never, like, sent something. I always thought that they ended up just replacing the big, the main mirror in it no they, they you couldn't do that you'd have to take the whole thing apart and then how would you ever get the alignments right and, and everything in the right position no they you can't take out that mirror and they never did oh okay all right so you started you're you're working on this uh with a professor trying to build mirrors out of epoxy and then so where did you go from there well, then I applied for graduate school, and I got into the University of Arizona, and I, that's where I went for graduate school in physics. And uh, that's I was always interested in one aspect of space called cosmic rays. And these are electrons and protons and things like that coming in from outer space at close to the speed of light and hitting the upper atmosphere and making a shower of particles or with the satellites above the atmosphere, they could measure these things coming in. And I always thought that was really fascinating. There are a couple of books I would read. I read One, Two, Three, Infinity, I think, by George Gamma, and maybe a couple of Bruno Rossi's books. But I, that was my interest, was cosmic rays. So at Arizona, I joined the high energy group, which was did two things. They were interested in cosmic rays coming in from space, and they were interested in the what makes up electrons and protons and atoms. And so they'd have experiments at accelerators where you'd send a bunch a proton in to smash into and say another proton and see what came out as a way to learn about the structure of protons or other particles. And so I joined that group and learned how to build detectors. Most of them were called scintillation detectors, where the particles hitting them gave off a flash of light. You measured the flash of light with a photo tube, and then you could, you know, say, "All right, it had this much energy and it came in at this time." You could start to do uh, tests on various things with these detectors, and so they had experiments. They were, the Arizona group was part of experiments that ran both at Argonne National Lab outside of uh, Chicago and at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab behind, up in the hills behind the University of California, Berkeley. And that uh, anyway, we were building detectors and I started working with a professor who 
wanted to build uh, a, a system on top of a mountain outside of Tucson. And we would look at cosmic rays coming in then, and the products they made when they hit the atmosphere. Okay, so the, let me, cosmic rays, that's, that's sort of something that I've always heard you, you talk about growing up. What are, are cosmic rays just sort of a, a big mix of all different types of X-rays and gamma rays and, and stuff like that? And where do they come from exactly? Or are they just cruising around like waves, you know, rippling outwards from something? Okay, first of all, cosmic rays nowadays I think of as they're particles. They are protons, they are neutrons, they are electrons, that all the things you think of as part of an atom. But then some of them are the nuclei of helium, meaning there's two protons and two neutrons coming in. And sometimes they're the nuclei of carbon and other elements. So they're all, all these different nuclei of elements are coming in, going very fast, and we measure them. And is it basically uh, the way you could sort of tell that one's the, the, the nuclei of, of helium or, or something else is when they hit one of your detectors, I guess the way the detectors work is a particle atom, electron, whatever, hits it, it generates a little bit of electricity, has a flash, you have something that measures the flash, and then somehow in that measuring, are you able to deduce, oh, this was the, the nucleus of helium or something like that? Yeah, you would have a, a set of, in, of detectors that would go through, and some would measure its path through your instrument, some would measure how much energy they lost giving going through each uh, detector and that energy loss is what makes the signal in that detector and maybe it's by having a magnet there's which way they curved in the magnetic field that would tell you whether it was a positive electric charge or a negative electric charge and some of it was how much energy did they lose in the different detectors because the higher the elements that are higher up in the uh, in the tables you know, helium, carbon on up would lose more energy than just a proton. So you could sort of get a guess as what it was by measuring several different things as it went through and then deducing what it was. Okay, so it, re it really is. There's a little flash and then depending on you're able to analyze that little flash of light or energy and really get pretty specific on what it was. Yeah, there's there's a balloon instrument that flew around Antarctica for I forget what 30 or 40 days at high altitudes measuring these things and they measured how much of each one of the nuclei of every one of the elements uh, came in and that's how you get an idea of how many of how the elements are made because oh only this much of uranium is made but that much of molybdenum was made this sort of thing they can measure with their detectors they can separate it into the individual uh elements wow that's and then then that sort of then branches into the whole or is that spectroscopy Yep. Okay. That's that's a kind of spectroscopy. Yes, but this gets into then the models of what's our theory for where these things came from and how did they get accelerated up to close to the speed of light, which is what we measure it to be when they get to Earth. And most of these are come out of stars that blow up, supernova explosions. Many of the elements are made in the star while it's its regular lifetime and then when it blows up the higher the z the larger atomic number elements are made in the explosions themselves and all this stuff then gets blown out into space when uh, the star blows up and part of it being blown out into space is it getting accelerated uh, by the shock waves that are created in the supernova explosion and that's a whole big scientific inquiry area of the uh, elements, you know, the origin of the elements, the gold in your wedding ring, you know, was made in an explosion of stars billions of years ago and just sort of condensed, all got together in a cloud 
due to gravity, and then that gravity form had it all collapsed down, and it made a star, and some of the stuff was left over, and that became planets, and that's how the solar system came about, we believe. So when a star explodes, does it yep. explode like the Death Star, where it's just there one minute and then kablowy, or is it a slow, a slow process? Well, what happens is initially a star like our sun is burnt, has nuclear reactions going on. You can think of it as a nuclear fire going on. And hydrogen is being used up and turned into helium. And then when the hydrogen is all used up, the star starts to shrink because it's really the light and the energy from the nuclear fusion that's holding the star up and making otherwise gravity would just have it all crashed down to being nothing at a point. So when the helium's used up, then, or hydrogen's used up, then the helium starts to burn and form, form carbon and nitrogen and stuff like that. And then when that the helium's used up, it starts to shrink again. And pretty soon it gets to a point where it can't shrink anymore. And there's just a big explosion. And that's... Uh, we see that as a supernova. All of a sudden, the star becomes about a billion times brighter to end in this explosion. And that's how we can see supernovae in distant galaxies, in other galaxies. And that we haven't seen one in our galaxy for three or 400 years, but we see them in other galaxies. And all of a sudden, there's just a star in that galaxy that's shining almost as bright as the whole galaxy. And so, and, uh, so can can we see or have we ever seen like a supernova? Because I mean, I imagine if just a star appears in the sky, your average person isn't going to say, "Hey, that point of light wasn't there last night." Right. That's that's true. But we there have been some. The biggest, the most famous one is happened in 1054 A.D when a star blew up and the Chinese astrologers uh, noted it. And it was sort of easy to notice for them because according to their notes, it was visible during the day for about a month and then for a much longer time at night. And that, That's that was a bright a, star if you could see it during the day. Yeah, yeah. And that was the closest one to us that went off that we really have some a little bit of knowledge of. There have been a few more since then. One that Johannes Kepler noted it, when it went off, and there's a couple others. Tycho Brahe saw one, but these are all back in, I don't know, the 1600s or thereabouts. But uh, then there was one that actually uh, was discovered on our father's birthday. It went off in 1987 on his birthday, and it was in the uh, Magellanic Clouds, a, a galaxy real, real close to us. But anyway, Supernova 87A was the, cl the first one to go off when we had all these modern instruments that can look at it. And everybody and their brother, from gamma rays to radio to optical, all studied that and we're still studying it to this day because we're watching the material expand out from the explosion. Okay, like the, the shock wave. Okay, well, how how do they know to watch it? Or was it, are people, I'm assuming we're sort of watching in all directions and then when something interesting happens, everyone sort of pivots and, hey, look at that. Is that how it works? Well, 87A was because it was so bright and there, it, a guy actually who was in charge of monitoring the sky for a bunch of southern telescopes and he was used to looking at the sky so the story goes noticed that wait a minute that star wasn't there and knew he had something but there is a whole industry of looking for supernovae in that it's a very interesting thing with respect to the way the universe is expanding, but that's a whole nother story. So there are telescopes all around the world, not real big ones, that are monitoring a whole set of galaxies. They might have a thousand galaxies they look at every night, and they look to see has some star all of a sudden appeared that wasn't there the night before. And so these are people, these are all being done every night 
And so I, there are, they then make announcements on what are called telegrams. They just send out emails to everybody. And you can see them. I get them every day that this one saw three optical transients, they call it, something in the optical that just showed up. And then they get the regular telescopes that will go track those and see what kind of supernova was it or was it something else like a star being torn apart, getting too close to a black hole. And uh, so, yeah, they their supernovae are being monitored and searched for every night. Not necessarily the whole sky, but a very reasonable uh, subset of the galaxies we know about. Wow, cool. All right, so you, you mentioned uh, you, you were at Berkeley for a while, right? Well, that's where the experiment was that I finally did for my thesis in that uh, I had, was told you we were work, working on this cosmic ray lab thing initially, and we were got, building a special magnet and a set of detectors to measure particles, but uh, building the magnet wasn't going so well in that it was a, called a superconducting magnet in that some materials, when they get really, really cold down close to the absolute zero, the coldest anything can get, they lose their resistance to electric flow, meaning electricity can flow through them without losing any energy, but that they don't heat up the wire the way your toasters do when you put current through them. And uh, we were gonna make it one of these wires because then you would take very little power to run a current through the magnet. And so it would be a very energy savings way of doing things. And you didn't have to worry about all the heat generated in the wires due to the resistance in the wires. But this was when technology in the superconducting wires was changing very quickly and we we're having trouble ever getting it to work. So when they, uh, the head of the high energy group Dr. Ted Bowen said, would I like to do a particle experiment for my thesis? I jumped at it as a way to actually finish in a reasonable time. And so we built detectors and took them to the Lawrence Berkeley lab where there was an accelerator called the Bevatron. And that's BEV atron, meaning billion electron volts atron. Now, is this, it, is this thing kind of like one of those big like rings where you have like a ring around this a whole city underground that stuff spins around and hits like the uh what's that big one that's supposed to discover dark matter and destroy uh, all the universe yeah cern yeah the cern it's, thing the it's hadron in, collider it's in, whatever yeah hadron collider that's in switzerland and uh italy because the ring is so large it goes into the two countries but no this one was it's that same idea yes a circular ring with magnets that have the particles running around in a circle but it was nowhere as deep or as as the size was much smaller i'm guessing it was maybe i don't know 100 feet 200 feet in diameter and it was just on the hill hillside outside berkeley above uh in the hills above the university at the Lawrence Berkeley lab. And so we uh, took our, our, paddle, our experiment there. The idea was we're still trying to understand what's inside of protons and this sort of, and elementary particles like that. And so the idea was that the accelerator would accelerate protons and the protons would hit a piece of metal a target and out of that would spew all sorts of elementary particles and one kind is called a pi meson which is sort of like an electron but heavier anyway and our what we wanted to know is what happens when a proton hits when a pion hits a proton and bounces straight backwards how many times out of all the you know million times that went in how many times did they bounce backwards and that would start to tell us a little bit about the structure of the proton and so that was our setup there and uh, it, it was fun we made the detectors the guys at the berkeley lab were phenomenal helping us i had to sort of chuckle in that they have big hunks of concrete that's shielding because there's a lot of radioactivity when you do this, all these particles spewing around. 
And but they here was a, a hunk of concrete labeled 30,000 pounds on a crane, and they're trying to put it to the nearest sixteenth of an inch on the floor. And I had to sort of chuckle to myself of who cares if it was off by half an inch. Anyway, it was fun to watch them do that. And we ran the experiment. And you may say, all right, where did we get all these protons for the pions to run into? And the best way to get a lot of protons is hydrogen. And to get more of them in there, instead of hydrogen gas, you get it cold enough to be liquid hydrogen. And then you have all these protons, and each proton just has one electron around it. That's what hydrogen is. So there is lots and lots of protons in there. So you're basically you're putting hydrogen into into the, this sort of hundred meter no, ring. No, or? no, the hundred meter ring shoots the protons out of the ring. Oh, into a, a target in essence. They're sort of tunnels. They okay. go down, and our, we had our tunnel. And it went down there. And so we, what, the way it was designed is there was just a little plastic uh, cylinder closed on each end, and you would fill that up with liquid hydrogen. Now, that's easier said than done in that this is all inside one of these cement tunnels, and you had uh, pipes that go from, a, from the little plastic uh, cylinder outside, and then you would hook up a tank of liquid hydrogen to the pipes to fill it. Now, liquid liquid si hydrogen sounds just like bad news. Yeah, ever since the Zeppelin blew up the Hindenburg, which allegedly was because it was full of hydrogen, uh, people don't like that, and OSHA doesn't like that. So, okay, we had to take the safety course on how to do it. We took, you know, there is procedures for doing it, and so we did that and when we were ready to fill the little guy we would call the the control room of the accelerator and say we would like to fill it with hydrogen and they announce over loudspeakers for everyone that first of all we're going to be getting the big doer it's a like a big uh, thermos jug of hydrogen it's a, i don't know about four feet high and like one of those but, milk jug looking things yeah but a but about four feet high, yeah, and maybe two feet in diameter, and it was on wheels. So we would pull it from the storage area over to where our pipe was to hook it up to fill up our target. And you hooked it up and opened the valve and started filling it. And as for safety reasons, they had an instrument called a sniffer. And it was just a little instrument that if it detected hydrogen, it would set off this claxton, this horn that would wake the dead. And the idea was you couldn't ignore it. That was the whole idea. Yeah, if you hear and, this horn, run. Yeah, except if you're the guys in charge of doing the filling, you had to run towards it to fix it. <laughs> yeah. And when it goes off at 2 in the morning, you know, you sort of, it wakes you up definitely. But, I mean, we were awake when we were doing the transfers. And it went off once, and I tell you, it it was an experience. But what had happened is just like on the Challenger where the O-ring froze and the Challenger blew up, the O-ring that was part of the seal to for the transfer had frozen and therefore was leaking. So all you had to do is go stop the transfer. The O-ring would warm up, and then you were fine. It didn't. You know, it was sealed, and this was the procedure, you know, with what we learned in the safety course. Anyway, so that was what we did at Berkeley, and that's what ended up being my uh, thesis experiment and got me out of grad school. Okay, and out of grad school, is that you went to what, Goddard? Well, first I had a nine-month uh, postdoc, again, at Arizona in the Dr. Charlie Fan was a professor there, and he had— a collaboration with the people at the University of Maryland for a high altitude balloon cosmic ray detector system. So I started working with him on that. And, and the reason the reason we use balloons is just because it's cheaper or they stay in the air longer or why why do we use balloons when we have satellites? 
uh, you hit the nail right on the head. They are much cheaper. Okay. And you don't, you can get your hands on the balloon. It can, you know, when it comes down, if something was wrong, you can fix it and go fly it again. Once you put the satellite up, that's it. You don't get it anymore. And yeah, balloons are much cheaper. And this is actually part of the way NASA does things is if you have a neat idea for a new kind of detector, you get some money to build it in the lab and yep, in the lab, it's working just the way I thought it would. And then you can fly it on a, either a sounding rocket that goes up above the atmosphere for a few minutes and comes back down, or you put it on a balloon high altitude balloon that'll go up to 130,000 feet and sit there for a while. And depending on how you've set things up, it can stay there for a day or mu or weeks, depending on where you're going. And that and show that it really works in, in space and it does measure cosmic rays or whatever you had designed it to do. And then you can say, all right, NASA, now I want to do a satellite mission, which is much more expensive, but I've shown I can do it. I've shown that I understand the detector. It works fine, and it's going to give the results of a certain scientific question that we wanted to study. And then uh, so we use high-altitude balloons to get above the atmosphere because the things we want to look at, get messed up when they come in and start hitting air molecules, hydrogen or nitrogen molecules, oxygen molecules that make up air. And the original particles coming in from outer space do not make it to the ground. They interact up in the upper atmosphere and make a shower of particles. And some of those particles are what make it to the ground. So if you want to study these things, you got to get above the atmosphere. And so satellites, high altitude balloons and sounding rockets are the way to do it wow okay so the particles are almost kind of like little super mini meteorites that come in whole and then when they hit the the atmosphere they kind of you know explode yeah, okay yeah i mean they're protons they're the night the nucleus of hydrogen basically the smallest things we ever deal with are protons neutrons, electrons, right. all the other elementary particles get a little exotic, but they're coming in from outer space and you want to measure those things. Yeah. Now, the other things, the things I've gotten into, you want to measure from uh, coming in from outer space are X-rays and gamma rays. And it turns out they won't make it through our atmosphere either, thank goodness, or we'd be in big trouble. Anyhow, so you have to get above the atmosphere, even going on top of a mountain isn't good enough. You have to get up above the Earth's atmosphere. These high altitude balloons, there's maybe, I forget the exact number, but you know, much less than a percent of the atmosphere is above you. So you can uh, then start to see these things. See them much clearer and before right. they get messed up. Okay. So, right. so you got, you went for, this was your second postdoc? This was my first postdoc, okay. and I did that. And Charlie Fan also had this idea that he wanted to study how the cosmic ray rate, that is how many of them are coming in per second or per week, whatever number you wanted, had it changed over time? You know, was it always the rate it is today? And so the University of Arizona have, has what's called the tree ring lab. And this is just a phenomenal lab where they're able to study tree rings. And you can count tree rings and you can know what year a certain tree ring was from. And there is a special tree called the bristlecone pine that grows up in the White Mountains that these guys found. They're very old trees, but when they die and fall over, they don't rot. It's very dry up there, so they've been able to take core samples from living trees and from dead ones that were on the ground and match the tree rings. And so they have a history of tree rings back thousands of years. And so Dr. Fan's idea was, well, let's just look at the carbon 14 content of the tree rings year by year. And that carbon 14 is made when charged particles like a proton comes in from outer space and smashes into a neutron, a nitrogen atom, and it'll make carbon-14. And so by how much carbon-14 you see gives you an idea of how much the cosmic rays, how many of them were coming in 
and also and also how long that <clears throat> thing's been around like the the tree oh yeah but the tree ring guys know they they can give you all oh, here's a tree ring from you know 2000 AD or 2000 BC they they know the exact tree ring and so they we teamed up with the guys in geology at Arizona Paul Damon in that they knew how to do all the pre preparation of it and they knew all the ins and outs about carbon-14. And Dr. Fancit thought he could make a better detector, more efficient detector that would let him get better measurements of the carbon-14. And then if we pick tree rings, you know, every hundred years going back, we might get an idea of how the cosmic ray flux changed, if indeed it did, over time. And... Uh, this was a great idea. Unfortunately, right about this time is when the carbon-14 guys figured out by far a much, much, much better way to do it. And they would do it with an accelerator in that they would get a very small sample of the tree ring, say, and vaporize it and accelerate that in an accelerator and then shoot it down a beam line that had a big magnet on it and carbon that would let them separate carbon 12 from carbon 13 from carbon 14 these are called isotopes of carbon which means that they have the same number of protons in the nucleus but they have differing numbers of neutrons and that means they're that's what an isotope is is different numbers of neutrons in an atom and so you would count how many carbon-14, carbon-13, carbon-12 was in there. And that way, you could measure the carbon-14 content much, much easier. And they came out with all sorts of amazing results. In that, uh, so, I mean, that, that's basically where carbon dating came from, right? That is carbon dating. And actually, after I left Arizona, I heard that the carbon-14 team there actually got a small piece of the Shroud of Turin to a date to see if indeed it came back with the date when Jesus was alive. And and survey says? Survey says, no, it's not that old. But then people argue, well, it was contaminated. People handled it. And maybe there was just dust and uh, algae and stuff from later periods that contaminated it. So I think it's still a matter of faith. Interesting. All right. So anyway, from Arizona, that's when Dr. Fance said, oh, they've got an opening at Goddard Space Flight Center outside Washington. Go apply there and you can do cosmic ray studies there. So I applied and was accepted there. But uh, Dr. Frank McDonald, who ran astrophysics at Goddard Space Flight Center, when I got there, said, how would I like to shoot off a rocket in nine months and look at a black hole in a neutron star? And I thought, cool, definitely. I yeah. like that idea. This sounded wonderful. And it turned out I would be looking at x-rays coming from the vicinity of black holes and neutron stars. And that's how I got into doing x-ray astronomy, which is what I do to this day. All right. Well, let's uh, let, let, let's pause on that, and uh, we'll sort of come back uh, another time and talk about your your experience with uh, with rockets and stuff. Uh, I appreciate your time, Dad. Oh, any time. All right. Any uh, any closing messages for uh, the one or two people who may listen to this? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm doing my best. I'm. May, my memory may not have everything perfectly right, but uh, I'm giving you my best shot. Hey, thoughts about the uh, – we just had a, a solar eclipse happen that it seemed like everyone in the country freaked out about this way more than any previous solar eclipse. And I'm guessing that's just because social media and everyone's so much more connected. What are your thoughts? Did you get to experience a solar eclipse? Yep, yep was there in Sun Valley, Idaho, with my wife, Marcy, at a scientific meeting where the meeting organizers were just smart enough to have the meeting on the path of totality. And it was phenomenal. It was just great, the total eclipse. It was marvelous. And I think the not only social media, but NASA and all the 
media outlets just really got on to this, that this is a once in a lifetime thing occurring all across the U.S. And uh, I think lots of people got to see it and could be excited about it. And it, I was just giggling and teeing. It was marvelous. And you noticed that that got colder. I swear the temperature must have dropped 15 degrees during the eclipse cycle because more and more of the sun was being blocked. Therefore, less and less of the sun's radiation was getting to Earth. And that's what dominates the temperature of the Earth pretty much is how much of the sun radiation gets in there. And it went down. And then after the eclipse and when we started to get more and more of the sun unblocked, the temperature came right back up again. It was neat. I loved it. Yeah, it kind of, I guess, gives you a little little feedback as to the, the idea of a nuclear winter. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, it's nighttime, basically, is the total eclipse. It just goes to nighttime. But cool. uh, what I liked is it came off exactly as predicted. You know, there were no glitches in the sun not being in the right place or the moon not being in the right place. The people who can predict this, who measure the path of the moon and the sun and the earth and all that sort of stuff, they had it just dead on right. It was great. Very cool. All right, Dad. Well, uh, I love you, and uh, let's talk again soon. Sounds great. Love you, too. All right. Bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. The, the first ever episode. Uh, like I said, we'll get better. We'll get more focused. Uh, we'll get my dad out of the uh, the, the rocket scientist uh, hangar that he was uh, recording in. And uh, that's about it. Once again, hope you guys have a great day. Hope you uh, sort of enjoyed it. Hope you maybe learned a little bit. I did. And uh, I grew up with the guy. Anyways, have a great day. Bye.